morning, Chair Cabaldon. Good morning. Just so you know, we are live and available for attendees to view us. Um, it seems like we do have a quorum present. So whenever it is time, uh, we're good. All right. <laughs> we have an extra extra sale volcano representative today. <laughs> yes, my grandson here. <laughs> Those of you who just joined us, we are live right now. Just waiting for a few more. The hour of 10 o'clock having arrived, let's call the uh, June 4th meeting of the Transportation Committee uh, for the Sacramento Council of Governments to order. And uh, we are meeting pursuant to the governor's executive order uh, via a teleconference, and the meeting is being held online only. It's open to public participation remotely, um, both for, through the live stream, and this meeting is also being recorded for, for later viewing as well. Public comments um, uh, can, uh, may be received, uh, may have been received already by our clerk in advance, but by email, um, by by telephone uh, participation in this meeting, uh, online as well. Um, and uh, uh, let me turn it over to the clerk, uh, to Jessica for the roll call and for any other additional opening information, um, housekeeping that's necessary for either members of the committee or for the public. And just also to ask um, everyone on the meeting including Kirk, to go on mute if possible when, when we're not speaking. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair Cabaldon, and good morning, everyone. Um, yes, like Chair Cabaldon said, uh, this meeting is available for those of the public to participate remotely. Um, if you need to notify us to make a comment, you may uh, do so in a few ways. You may raise your hand, use the chat feature or the Q&A features. 
And if you're participating telephonic telephonically, you may press star nine to alert us. Um, and I will call roll now. Uh, Director Harris. I'm here, good morning. Good morning. Director Joyner. Here. Director Peters. Absent. Director Samayela. Here. Thank you. Director Sander. Absent. Director Saylor. Here. Thank you. Director Chenier. Absent. Director Slowey. Here. Director Verkan. Here. Hang on, Andy. I did. Vice Chair Jennings. Here. Vice Chair Soon. Here. And Chair Cabaldin. Here. Thank you very much. All right, and, and Mancourt, do we have a, a, a flag available for display for the Pledge of Allegiance? I believe we do. All right. Uh, then, Ms. Mr. Uh, Slowey, would you mind leading us in the pledge? I'd be happy to. Pledge allegiance to the flag right. of the United States of America. States of America. And to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director and Mr. Slowey and our staff. Uh, so we'll now we'll proceed to uh, public communications. And Ms. Lee, do we have um, public communications on matters that are not on our agenda? Ms. Lee, you're on mute. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, yes, we, we have received public comment. However, it did exceed the 250 word limit. So it has been made available on our website as a handout and it has been sent out to the committee in advance to this meeting. So I will not be reading it. Okay, thank you very much. Then we'll uh, now adjourn at our recess as the transportation committee and, and convene as the uh, Capital Valley Regional Service Authority for Freeways and Expressways Committee, uh, which has its own separate agenda. So we'll substitute the roll call and accept that we will ask Ms. Lee to call the roll for the members uh, from our um, other county members who are not part of SACOG. Absolutely. Uh, Director Wynn. Present. Director Young. Present. Thank you very much. All right, welcome to both of you. Uh, and Ms., uh, uh, Ms. Lee, do we have any public communications for the SAFE Committee agenda? We do not. All right, then that brings us to the consent agenda, which is simply the minutes from the May 7th meeting. Are there any uh, questions or comments or, or changes to the minutes? Move approval. I'll second. second. All right. Um, Jessica, did you get the move and second? I... Move approval. Oh, David Sander. And, and, and who's the second? Was that Miss Young? Yes, I originally did, but. Yeah, so okay. Yes, was. <laughs> um, Chair Cabaldin, I believe I missed someone who did have their hand out when we were asking for public comment. In the SAFE meeting? Um, I'm sorry, they, they raised their hand at 10.05, and I believe that could have been prior. It's from Dan Ellison. And he says uh, that he's transportation committee. For the comment. Transportation. Okay. All right. Then oh, further. No, no, no problem. We're all okay. so if there's no other uh, discussion, then we have a motion by Ms. Uh, Director Sander and a second by Director Young uh, to approve the consent agenda, which is item one. Um, uh, Ms. Lee, would you please call the, the roll? Absolutely. Director Harris? Yes. Director Joyner? Yes. Director Peters? Absent. Director Samayua? Yes. Director Sander? Yes. Director Saylor? Yes. Director Shamir? Um, absent. Director Slowey? Yes. Director Verkan? Aye. Director Wynn? Yes. Director Young? Yes. Vice Chair Jennings? Yes. Vice Chair Soon? Aye. Chair Cabaldin. Yes. All right, so that motion carries.
So we'll now proceed to item two, which is um, the uh, approval of the final CPR safe fiscal year 2020-21 budget. Ms. Von Bechtel. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, before you, you have the final fiscal year 2021 CVR safe budget. Um, the draft that you saw at the May 21st meeting was released for public review following that meeting. And thus far, we haven't received any comments on the budget. Um, the final fiscal year 2021 budget uh, that you have in attachment A to the staff item is the same budget that you reviewed in May and estimates the cost for operations and maintenance of the call box system, enhanced services like freeway service patrol and special projects listed in the attachment. The CVR safe bylaws require that the budget be approved before July 1st of each fiscal year. So staff would like to request the CVR safe committee recommends that the CVR safe board approve adoption of the final fiscal year 2020-21 CVR safe budget. And also want to note that staff are going to continue to monitor vehicle registration trends because vehicle registration is the main source of revenue for the safe. Um, throughout the fiscal year and adjust the budget if necessary. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there other questions? Dr. Jennings, did you have a question or are you just, just you're still off mute for? Ah, oh, there we go, okay. Director Young. I don't have questions, just ready to make motion. Oh, great, okay. <laughs> then so I moved. Okay, it's been moved by Director Young. Second. Director, seconded by Director Soon. Uh, any director wishing to be recognized on this item? And, and uh, Ms. Lee, we, we had no public comment on this on this item either, correct? No, we do not. All right. Okay, then seeing uh, no further discussion on this item, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Absolutely, and before the meeting ends, I'd like to note that uh, Ms. Tacker is here on behalf of Amber Chief Benapol our ex officio member. Um, okay, Director Harris? Yes. Director Joyner? Yes. Director Peters? Absent. Director Samayoa? Yes. Thank you, Director Sander? Aye. Director Saylor? Yes. Director Chenier? Absent. Director Slowey? Yes. Director Veerkamp? Yes. Director Wynn? Yes. Director Young? Yes. Vice Chair Jennings? Yes. Vice Chair Soon? Yes. And Chair Cabaldin? Yes. All right, so that motion carries as well. And that is all the business we have under the CVR Safe Committee. So thank you, Director Wynn and Director Young for, for joining us. Um, and uh, we will then adjourn the safe committee meeting and, and reconvene uh, the meeting of the transportation committee for safe talk. And that brings us to item, uh, let's, since we did receive a request for public comment uh, within the appropriate time frame for under items not on the committee agenda, let's go to that now, um, Madam Clerk. Okay, I'm gonna bring Dan Ellison over to provide his comment. Dan, you should be able to um, speak and the committee will hear you now. Okay, thank you. Um, Dan Allison, a resident of Sacramento. My comments relate to the bike share program. Um, I was concerned as many people were when just when we needed more mobility options, jump pulled out without telling anybody, um, without communicating with the community, they just pulled all their devices and left. Um, and um, as many people have said, a return to normal is not what we need. We need something better than uh, what was normal before. So I have some requests. Um, first, that SACOG be actively involved uh, in discussions about what the new system is going to look like and not simply wait for Lyme to make a decision. Um, the new system cannot be solely a private system. It could be a public system or a public-private partnership, but it cannot be private. And we know why, because um, a private company can do what it wants and leave people in the lurch. Um, I think my chair needs to be seen as part of the transit system and therefore the transit agencies need to be partners in the program. Um, and um, 
I think that equity needs to be part of the design from the beginning. Uh, equity elements were added to the program as it went along before, but um, largely they were not there at the beginning, but I think they need to be there from the beginning this time. Um, there needs to be significant public funding for the bike share program. And if we take that money away from roadways, that is just fine with me. Um, there, the devices need to be rentable through transit cards and through the transit app. And we have to have a low income offering, um, perhaps like Jump offered before, or perhaps something different, but there needs to be a low income offering. So I would like to see um, bike share be on the next transportation committee agenda um, to be discussed. And I would like to see staff actively um, pursuing a better bike share system. Thank you. All right, thank you much, uh, uh, Mr. Allison. All right, then with that, we're gonna proceed to item one, which is our consent agenda, the minutes from May 7th. Um, are there any corrections or changes or discussion or question or a motion? Motion made, the, they appear to be in order and I would like to make a motion to approve. All right, it's been moved by Director Jennings. Second Joyner. Seconded by Director Joyner. Thank you. Seeing, seeing no discussion, uh, Ms. Lee, would you please call the roll? Yes, Director Harris? Yes, thank you. Director Joyner? Yes. Director Peters? Absent. Director Samayoa? Yes. Director Sander? Aye. Director Saylor? Aye. Director Chenier? Absent. Director Slowey? Aye. Director Rearcam? Aye. Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. Vice Chair Soon? Aye. Chair Cabaldon? Aye. Thank you. All right, so that motion carries and item one is approved. That brings us then to item two, which is the 2020 Trade Corridor Enhancement Program project nominations. Mr. Carpenter, is this you? Actually, it's gonna be Mr. Doherty. Uh, oh, Mr. Doherty. Yes, Chris Doherty will pick it up. I'm, I'm of course available for questions though. Yes, good morning, Chair and members of the Transportation Committee. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, the item before you uh, this morning is the SICOG nominations for the state's uh, tr Trade Corridor Enhancement Program. This is the second cycle of this SB1 funded program. Um, the program has approximately $1 billion in funding statewide and sets targets, uh, funding targets for specific regional corridors throughout the state. The regional corridor that SICOG is in, which also includes the Bay Area, has, in fu has a funding target of approximately $225 million. This program seeks to fund projects that contribute to the state's economic freight, freight economic activity, excuse me, uh, relieve congestion on freight systems, uh, improve safety, security, resilience of the freight of the state's state freight system and improve or preserve freight infrastructure, uh, support innovations in freight activities and reduce or avoid community or environmental impacts of freight activities. State uh, staff released a call for projects in April to all jurisdictions in the six county region asking for projects who want to be submitted to this program. We had received four projects requesting a nomination to apply to this program. Uh, they are the Safe Freight for the Capital Region project, Washington Boulevard and Andorra Underpass project, Capital Southeast Connector project, the US 50 Camino Safety and Community Access Mitigation project. All projects that are requesting nomination are consistent with the 2020 MTP SES and applications for this program are due on August 3rd of this year. So at this time st staff is recommending that the committee recommend to the board to nominate the four projects to move forward to apply to this program. And I'm available for any questions you may have. All right, are there questions for Mr. Doherty? Some? Any? I, I have a generic question, oh, or maybe a dumb question. Um, could you give us some idea of the scoring of these in terms of how is the state, what, what's the state looking for um, in terms of funding? And I'll, I'll just lay out my situation. You know, in Rancho, we have a lot of manufacturers, um, but our, one of the consistent barriers they name to being a manufacturer in Rancho Cordova is access to Highway 50, because Sunrise Boulevard is, is a mess. It's, it's uh, not reliable enough for them. 
And so for us, the Capital Southeast Connector is that, you know, econ other economic option for shipping stuff in and out of uh, the manufacturers in Rancho Cordova. But often it doesn't qualify as, um, as, a, as a corridor. Uh, and no one looks at this issue of shipping that's almost never considered. So I'm just curious as the how the state's going to evaluate this one. So the state is looking, uh, the requirement for this program is that all projects um, approved will need to be either on a freight corridor or a designated state corridor. And uh, we are looking into what that process is right now and how long that takes. Um, we are currently working with our state partners on that um, for some of the projects that are on this list right now, one of them being the connector. So we are trying to address that right now. Just one thing I may add, um, Director, um, is that we, the, you know, as Chris was saying, we're, we're definitely wanting to get a, a better sense of kind of how the valuation will go this year. Um, what you raise is an issue that was certainly a, some of the criticism in the 2018 program that arterials that connect to a significant freight corridor, typically on a highway, a state highway, um, aren't weren't as competitive in terms of the funding. This time around and for this cycle, they have made more of those type of projects eligible. Um, you, you can be off the, a, a significant freight uh, corridor, but you just don't have as much competitiveness. So we're, we're trying to make sure uh, you know, the subjectivity that sometimes happens with evaluation criteria to make sure we better understand exactly what, what's going on with uh, how they will evaluate the projects that are submitted. So they broadened eligibility, but it remains to be seen. Uh, based on the performance criteria, there is a little still, one could say, and kind of a tilt towards kind of more significant or larger projects that have significant freight travel. But you raise a very good point, that last mile um, of arterials that connect to uh, highway are certainly corridors that are critical. And that last mile for freight delivery is something that we've been advocating in our comments to the state on this program and in other efforts that those are well considered for state funding. Yeah, it would seem like the number of jobs, uh, the value of the product being shipped, you know, inter international trade component of it, all those sorts of things <laughs> would seem to be relevant to it. But doesn't often fall into the normal metric of are you next to the state designated corridor that's been there for 100 years? Well put. That's exactly the criticism we've been hearing in, in terms of the first cycle. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Other uh, questions or comments on this item? Sadler moves approval. Oh, Sadler moves approval. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Director Soon. All right, and Madam Clerk, do we have any uh, request for public comment on this item? We do not. All right, then if there's no further discussion. Would you please call the roll? Yes. Director Harris? Yes. Thank you, Director Joyner? Director Joyner? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Director Peters? Absent. Director Samayoa? Aye. Thank you. Director Sander? Aye. Director Saylor? Aye. Director Chenier? Absent. Director Slowey? Aye. Director Veerkamp? Aye. Vice Chair Jennings? Aye. Vice Chair Soon? Aye. And Chair Cabaldon? Aye. And so that motion carries. That brings us to item three, which is an update on safer, affordable, fuel efficient vehicles rule. Uh, Mr. Caceres. Good morning. Hello, everyone. I, I bring good news. The air quality conformity lockdown is over. And what this means is that we can amend our transportation projects, finally. Um, I feel like I get called in when it's uh, time to present on arcane transportation programming uh, topics. And my goal is to make these uh, easily understood. So I'm gonna go through uh, how we got here, uh, what this will mean for us and our next steps. So uh, we've heard of the safe rule. Uh, it's actually broken into two parts. There's the safe rule part one and the part two. Uh, when we saw that safe rule part one was going to be published, uh, we knew that that would send us into something that we coined called an air quality conformity lockdown. Uh, this is different from Corona. <laughs> an air quality conformity lockdown is where you can't amend the projects in your long range transportation plan or your short range transportation improvement program, uh, the TIP, uh, because for some reason or another. In this case, what happened is the safe rule revoked California's ability to set cleaner fuel standards. By doing so, it called into question our assumptions baked into our plan and our model for what the future fleet would look like. 
turns out the future fleet's going to be dirtier if we can't use our standards. And what that would mean is we wouldn't have been able to receive federal approval for our MTP or an amendment to the TIP that relied on analysis using uh, California's own standards. So we adopted our MTP, if you recall. That was a, a, a big lift for lots of folks. Um, and we uh, avoided the lockdown. We were able to amend the TIP uh, and publish our plan. And uh, I've been asked uh, several times, you know, what projects are affected by this lockdown? And the good news is by update, we were able to uh, most or all projects that could have been affected. Um, we can't go forever without updating projects, but we've been able to go, what, November? We've been able to go uh, the, these seven, eight months just fine. Um, then what happened is uh, ARB was able to do adjustments to the model in what I thought was record time and get them accepted by EPA. Uh, those adjustments ended the lockdown. Uh, but we were waiting for the other shoe to drop, which was uh, Safe Rule Part 2. We expected that to result in the need for more adjustments to our model, a different, again, a different future for uh, what the fleet would look like. And so we are expecting that lockdown to uh, be short. Um, the item says that we are surprised, actually, to find ourselves in a, in a lockdown that's ended so soon. Part 2 turns out it regulates a type of uh, emission, CO2, that is actually not controlled by federal air quality conformity standards which means we don't actually have to change our model again, which means that lockdown that ended is still over. We're out of a lockdown. So um, what this means for us is we can finally uh, take a project that said it was gonna go from here to there and they can go from here to a little further and we can show it in the model and uh, we can show whether or not we will pass. We can take a project that receives funding uh, suddenly from one of these programs like what Chris Story was talking about and we can show its completion year moving forward two, three, four, five years. Um, and we can model that to see if we will stay, still attain our clean air goals on time. So it, it means we're, we're no longer constrained uh, in that effect, in that way. Uh, but there is another implication, which is not really the lockdown, it's that safe rule part one and part two are still a thing. They still are in effect. California cannot um, uh, set more strict standards for fuel. Uh, for fuel emissions, which means uh, we still, not just SACOG, but the whole state that is in non-attainment areas, 5% of the state, the whole state is going to have a harder time we can attain our clean air goals for all those different uh, dirty chemicals that come out of tailpipe, plus just regular CO2, GHG gases. Um, so we have, we have work ahead of us for our MTP and um, so do other regions. So I want to talk about just briefly next steps. We had to delay the adoption of our short range MTIP, as the whole state did. Um, and we're going to be resuming that on a new schedule. Uh, and that will come before the board. Um, I have the schedule probably around uh, December or so. And then um, when we do so, that'll probably be an amendment to the MTP. We will not be changing the MTP in any sort of a substantial way. It's just sometimes projects move forward or move backward or uh, they uh, change uh, in scope. Um, in conclusion, the good news is the lockdown is over. The bad news is we're still here with the safe rule. And that's the end of my item. I'll take any questions. Questions for staff? And do we have any? Oh, Director Suen? Yeah, thank you. Uh, 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 Jose, I was just wondering, uh, with the, the teleworking, are you planning to, uh, I mean, I, I think we kind of talked about this, are you planning to incorporate that into the MTP to see if that's able to offset some, uh, some of the, uh, you know, our inability to, to set stricter air quality standards? That's a great question. I'd like to open it up for Matt or James to weigh in on that. Uh, Director Soon, you remember um, we've had you've had a couple of they've been sort of truncated but brief presentations from Monica Hernandez the last couple of meetings around a, a regional telework initiative. So number one, we actually do assume um, some level of telework in our 20 year plan that's already uh, that you adopted last fall. And number two, we're trying to figure out just on the ground in the next few months how we can work with employers to actually make telework stick. And then the, the, the last piece of that is we do want to re-engage with ARB to see how they're giving us credit for those things. Um, so, so, so stay tuned. That's the, yeah. 
a good question. Is, uh, is it possible that, you know, for, for lack of a better term, just conceptually, if you cranked up the dial, so to speak, on telework, make up the difference? Or is, is that something that, you know, we're going to need to, we're going to need to find other means? Well, I was, you know, what's, of the, the, the assumption that you did for telework, I, I'm just, you know, throwing out numbers here, but it was like a, maybe it's a 10% assumption, but if you increase that to a 30%, uh, you know, teleworking would, does that make a significant difference? It, it, it certainly would, uh, depending on the other trips that then, right, if, if, you know, the, the question from a research perspective and, a, and an actual data perspective is, you know, are people then traveling more around their home doing running errands once the COVID lockdown is over? Um, are there, you know, are you replacing a long commute trip with a lot of short trips? I mean, so far we believe the evidence is it on a, on the whole, it's better for VMT and air quality. Um, so, so you're asking the right questions. I think in the, it, let, let's see what we can do with this regional telework initiative, the full board meeting in two weeks, you will get another presentation on where we are. We're doing focus groups. Um, I think if we can show that we can actually make some progress on telework in the, in the, as we reopen workplaces, uh, I think that's the best evidence we have in terms of then working with ARB on the successive greenhouse gas targets, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Oh, I mean, we have, uh, I mean, there, over, the, over this planning period, over our, the planning periods associated with our other, with our GHG requirements and everything else, there's both the the like the total amount of emissions that we'll be producing over, between now and uh, 2050 or whatever the planning horizon is, but then there's also the what is the what is our level or per capita or whatever whatever metric of, of emissions at that point, right? So um, and and uh, you know so, so the, the the just like wildfires had you know had an effect last year in terms of some forms of emission, they're not we're not projecting forward wildfires through the, you know, every year throughout the whole period. And if we were, that would change our metrics, but it doesn't necessarily, that wildfire itself doesn't put us into a, into a lockdown. And so I think as we're, we're going to, we're, we're in different ways, we're going to be grappling with both these questions. Like what does it mean for the moment? And then what does it mean in terms of long-term, the changes in the long-term metrics? So I, I, I agree. This is really, it is really a good question. Um, both in this space, plus the MFAC model and the, and the, the state rules. I mean, there's so much, like everything else, there's so much uncertainty um, in these pieces. So I think we're all going to be, we're all going to be called upon to, to ask these kind of questions to, and to go through some of the, the, the staff attempts to try to, uh, re, you know, rebalance and recalibrate all these models with, uh, with the, just the, the number of changes that are happening all at once. So thanks for raising that, um, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, James. Precisely. Oh, I would just add, I would be remiss to point out that there is, um, oh, Kirk Trust could have probably added this too. There, uh, there is still, there are still uh, court cases going on on this and uh, things might change if uh, the administration were to change. Um, so the story on the safe rule itself isn't necessarily over. Uh, I'll, I'll stop talking. All right, Vice Chair Samayoa. I'm having a hard time unmuting myself. If I can do the minimum, I'm not sure how good I am at this whole thing, but um, uh, I just thoughts really not related to this, but I really appreciate uh, Director Soon's comments because it made me think about things like at the local level, uh, things that we can engage on to kind of contribute to that, whether it's, um, you know, our own codes or our own, you know, you know, to allow people to work out of their offices or they want to make improvements or, even infrastructure improvements when it comes to you know rural areas to assure that they have uh, the necessary uh, connectivity or Wi-Fi or whatever it may need. Like even you know how do we add those things as well as we start thinking about people working out of their homes or not necessarily going to an office and having space and uh, at the local level assuring that there's no barriers um, that that would take away from that or or make it harder. So thank you for bringing that up, uh, Director Soon. I just, I think as we think about funding and other things, it's like, how do we make, you know, put the puzzle together and make sure that other areas are also being taken into consideration as, as we move forward on this or making adjustments on our plans.
Thank you, Director Zamayo. And, and, and also, don't worry, when, when, when you become the board chair, you never have to go on mute, so you're, you'll be fine, though. <laughs> other, other questions or discussion? <laughs> All right, this uh, is an information item only, so thank you, Mr. Gautaras. And let's move on then to our next item, which is item four, the update on the Sacramento Region Parks and Trails Strategic Development Plan. Ms. Gautaras. Hello, uh, I am looking to share my screen and it looks like I should be able to do that now. And You'll give me one second, please. Good to look for all of you. I, I'm Victoria Cacciatore, and I'm here to present an update on the Regional Parks and Trail Strategic Development Plan, which is our opportunity to continue building out multiple time modal options for our region and also to build off of our Long range plan, the MTPSES. We know that tra trails and open space bring minute way for people to travel to work, to school, for errands, or for fun. And this plan is meant to be how we purposefully create the connected regional trail network that will equitably benefit our many residents. This is also during a time when trails are a critical resource to communities figuring out how to adapt to social distancing requirements and other public health mitigations. From a Rails to Trails Conservancy survey of trail managers last month, trail systems are being used more than ever previously recorded. And nationally, numbers of trail users have spiked nearly 200% compared to last year. So there's definitely an appetite for increased trail networks and they're serving more roles than we've ever imagined. So when we're looking at what we need to do with this plan, we need to figure out both what is standing in our way of developing the regional trail network and how to cast those hindrances aside. So what we have currently is a trail network with you know, some really great trails in place, but it's also disconnected. It's hindered by cost and coordination needs. And in some areas, the development of the trail system is not prioritized. So what we're looking to do is de designate our network that will achieve regional goals that tie back to what is important locally. So here we have something that I found that was pretty interesting. I have a number of uh, pictures of trails in my arsenal. I normally like with one or two people doing it. And I found this great one online. And I'd like to note it's from the Visit Sacramento website. We have great trails on the ground already that we are even saying like, you should come here because look at these great things that you can do while you're here. It demonstrates the great potential we have for even what many people are interested in. Not only how do we provide a benefit for our residents, but how do we entice more people to come check out Sacramento? Maybe even this is their first step to living here. Of these notable trails that we do have, uh, a lot of them are, uh, they're due to the past visions of implementers that came before us. We have a good number of parks, the majority of, or the majority of our trails are in some form of parks and open space. Uh, only 42% of our existing trail network is located outside of parks and open space. So that has some really strong implications for our existing trail networks potential to serve recreational and health outcomes because uh, a trail is going to be a place where you can ride a bike or go for a run without worrying about you know somebody driving up way too fast behind you and ac accidentally running you over and uh, it's also a really good place for say a, a person who's not really used to riding a bike learning how to get comfortable on it and that's why you see so many pictures of you know kids learning how to ride their bike on a trail uh, i would like to also point out that it's kind of interesting how few of our existing trails 
are located in and along flood control and water management areas. This is an interesting area because when you look at what are the places that people have said they want to get to in your local plans, either your active transportation plans or your general plans, the top eight, six out of the top eight destinations are along waterways. Uh, local planning documents saying people want to get to the American River or the Sacramento River, the Feather River, Folsom Lake, Kasumnis River, Yuba River. So this represents a really interesting area of opportunity of how we can increase access to our local waterways that people know are part of what makes our region amazing. From what we did to uh, identify where there are trails and where there are not trails, we were able to do a snapshot of seeing who does have access to trails in our region. And we saw that less than half of the region lives within a half mile of a trail of any length. We also saw that only a quarter of the existing trails are located in disadvantaged communities. And that's compared to how 37% of the residents in our region live in MTP SES environmental justice areas. On top of that, we know that from our MTP SES analysis, Residents of environmental justice areas are more likely to ride a bike, walk, or take transit for their daily trips than residents of non-environmental justice areas. So without trails to serve these people, your residents have no choice but to use the on-road networks that may be uncomfortable or worse, unsafe. When we were first looking at our our trail accessibility and who has access to the trails. We thought it looked not great, but also surprisingly not as bad. I, I mean, when I saw that about 48% of the region lived within a half mile of a trail, I thought like, well, that, that's better than what I thought it would be. But then we started to look a little bit closer at our data and we saw that there are a lot of really small trails that make this picture of accessibility seem rosier than it actually is. So to set a threshold for looking at what is a trail that's going to provide either some connectivity benefit or at least a, a good space for you to go out for a walk. We set a, a threshold of a trail that's going to be at least a half mile long, which is a conservative estimate of how far a person might be able to get on a 10 minute walk. And while that decreased our total trail mileage by about 7% or a little over 30 miles, it had a much more significant impact on the number of dwelling units within a half mile of trails. That went from the 48% that I mentioned earlier down to 40% people living within a, a half mile of a trail that's a half mile or longer. So that's 76,000 households fewer with access to a trail that might have some potential for connecting them to their local errands or at minimum providing them a place to go out and get their heart rate up for a little bit. So we are now going to start working a bit more closely with our partners, uh, forming technical advisory committees throughout the region, because for this to be a regional trail network, we do need to engage the whole region. But many people have uh, noted the ineffectiveness of trying to have one big regional meeting historically in downtown Sacramento, when that's not really going to show us and it's not going to allow our partners to showcase what they're talking about when they're saying that there's a, a great potential for this rail corridor in Yuba City or this trail along the the levee top in Marysville. So we're going to be working in smaller geographically based groups with our partners to both vet our groundwork and learn more about the on-the-ground conditions 
and then also to hear from our local partners and see what we can do to align this regional plan with their local priorities and understand what our common goals are. So it'll give us a great opportunity to leverage our existing assets of what trails are on the ground already, how they're used, and where people want to connect those trails to. From our initial analysis of local planning documents, we have that safety is obviously a huge concern for anybody who's looking at how they can develop their active transportation network and how they can provide for their residents. But we also know that there is a significant interest in how we can connect to our local main streets and these other commercial corridors that, that often serve as the heart of these communities. My apologies, my computer seems to have. All right, there we go. Uh, this is all leading up to how later this year we plan to come back with you and ask you to weigh in on the priorities that are used to identify what existing planned and proposed trail connections should be included in our regional trail network. Because the same way that we have a lot of those micro trails that aren't providing the connectivity benefits the same way that we have roadways that are not or that are going to be serving primarily our neighborhood needs as opposed to a regional need not every trail segment has a place in our regional trail network the way that we strategically connect our region together and stitch them together with an active modes comparable safe network And following the identification of that network, we look into adopting the final trail network in early 2021. And then also how we kickstart this network by prioritizing the implementation of phases and get, get our uh, trail network moving forward. So with that, I'll take any questions. Are there are there questions from Ms. Gatchadori and, and Ms. Lee, or if you can also check, do we have any requests for public comment on this item as well? Um, Director Sander. Um, I, I was looking through the uh, the map uh, that was given, and I noticed you, you don't appear, you have a designation for a class one, which is obvious, that's the traditional trail we all think about, but there's no designation for class four. And I was kind of curious about that. And I don't know how many people are actually familiar with class four. It's the, the newest designation. It means a physically separated, but on the road bike trail. So think of a very wide street and you narrow it, you keep traffic in the middle, you build a barrier and then create a pedestrian path bike trail in like where the parking area used to be. And maybe you put parking between that and the actual roadway, but there's a physical separation. So are class four not being considered as a, as a trail? We haven't been considering class four as a trail at this point because uh, with the design standards that are set by Caltrans, you are not permitted to walk in those. So it would almost need to be a consideration of where do you have a class four coupled with a sidewalk? And we were looking to get a bit more feedback from local agencies about how they felt that that might fit in. We were starting with the more constrained idea of what this trail network is going to be and having it be more of the uh, restricted vehicle access largely separated from the roadway. But I think that we are open to considering how a class four, especially a class four coupled with a sidewalk where people could walk right. in the area could serve to connect more people to designated trail networks because they're uh, how we expand access equitably to different areas is also going to exactly. be part of what we do to look at the trails. Yeah, in an already built environment, um, many of us have these super wide local streets and it is possible to retrofit those and have just as much traffic throughput using far less pavement than was originally designated. So what we've done in Ranch Cordova is take the super wide street 
create that class four on either side. So you've got sidewalk, then class four, then a barrier, then parking, usually maybe alternating one side or the other, then through traffic, sort of shoved to the middle or slightly off the middle. Um, and that is a way to get a trail to an existing neighborhood where you've got no other corridor to put that trail through. Um, and so I'd sort of hate to see that, that ignored because the other test I used to apply when talking about this was where would I be willing to take my, my son when he was six uh, on his bicycle? Where would I feel safe riding alongside of him? And a class four would probably do it. A class one certainly would. Although in the American River Parkway now, I'm not so sure because of the number of, you know, 25 mile per hour bicyclists out there, but uh, who yell at you if you're, if you're going too slow. <laughs> so that may not be as safe as you would think. But anyway, I think that class four sort of serves an important role there. So that, would, that might bear some, some consideration. I know the data collection might be a little tougher, but there probably aren't that many class fours in the region either. Uh, no, they're not. I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but I'm fairly certain it's under 20 miles worth. We do have that data. And on the opportunity side, you know, something we've looked at in Ranch Cordova, and it's probably uh, an opportunity throughout the region, is these old drainage canals. You know, Sacramento County, uh, God bless them, built these huge cement ditches. Uh, they're very wide, moderately deep. Uh, they often have an access road along the side and they cut right through neighborhoods, all the way through neighborhoods, and they end up in the river. Um, and so where for most of Ranch Cordova, almost all of Ranch Cordova, you've got the American River uh, Parkway Trail. So for us, that is sort of like an existing network. If we could just figure out how to underground that drainage a little bit further, because you know upstream of wherever that ends, there's underground drainage. If you just underground that, these are corridors through existing communities where you could put a trail in a nice wide corridor with, with no other competing traffic of any kind. You've got to cross streets, that's a challenge, but it's a, it's a potential for a, a really great system. There's enormous neighborhood opposition to this, 100% opposition whenever we brought it up, because um, people imagine all kinds of criminal activity happening behind their house. Of course, it's already happening there if they're that worried about it and it's an isolated, you know, uh, only partially accessible area now. This would open it up and make it safer. But you know, putting that sort of uh, opportunity, I think, on the map, and sort of as a region undertaking an effort to say, hey, you know, we can really connect ourselves using these these awful cement ditches that are already already there might make a lot of sense. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Director Shen. I I, I want to uh, um, really agree and also point out the you know the class four. Um, issue in some sense to me is a subset of a of a challenge I have with kind of how we're framing these neighborhood trails but I I also maybe it's the time um, the time the moment that we're in at, at, at this stage I want to really encourage our um, our you know our planning team across the region to approach these kinds of issues with the with some perspective and some humility around the lived experiences of, of uh, disadvantaged communities and communities of color, poor communities, and the assumptions that we often make about what they want. And I, and I can hear this already bubbling up in some of this, and, but also in terms of who we then consult with. What partners do we ask about what are needed? Um, you know, I'm reminded in the, the Bright and Broderick neighborhoods of my city, they're the poorest neighborhoods of West Sacramento. They're, they are the longest standing um, uh, Latino core neighborhoods of my city, although my city is now 40% Latino. Our, and just as a, uh, for folks who, who, who our council is 80% people of color. Um, uh, and as we started doing planning work uh, around some of these choices a, a few years back, we got a bunch of recommendations from UC Davis students and others about all of and the investments that need to be made. And what kept coming back was at the top of the list in all of the, na the neighborhood based outreach was. We want better access to the riverfront, which is a mile away. Not to get there, but when we get there, we want to be able to do something. We want trails on the water. Um, and, and, and that was the beginning of, of the presentation that Victoria just made. Um, uh, if we had done, if we had instead invested money in trying to create half mile trails inside the neighborhood instead of the riverfront, uh, it might have made us feel better about our commitment to equity, but it wasn't what they, what residents of the neighborhood really wanted. 
They know how to navigate their neighborhood. Uh, I mean, it's not a foreign place to them. They know what, which routes are safe to walk and to bike. And if, they, if there aren't any at all, they let us know. And where we can fix it, we usually, we do, but we don't do it half mile at a time in an existing neighborhood. That's impossible. That's just, I, I, can't, I can't build, build trails in a built environment at a half a mile at a, at a, at a pop. Um, and I, so I need to get credit for and count when, when we do a block here and a block there because we got a CDBG grant or a, uh, an inclusion grant or whatever else. We, you know, we gotta make the progress that where we can, but also recognize that folks are going somewhere on these trails um, and that they want to enjoy the, the riverfront. And that's why in our surveys too, just like Victoria mentioned region wide, in every single one of our surveys, those are the places that are ranked highest and not just by the, you know, the, the suburban parts of our city. Everywhere in the city ranks, I wanna be on, uh, I want long trails that I can recreate on and take my family on, maybe go somewhere else. But it's, but I just, I, I say this because um, uh, we're, we, you know, we're in a moment, I know where we're all getting lots and lots of, of, of advice from folks who are newly woke um, around, around, around issues um, and have very strong opinions about what equity means but it is really important that we understand equity from the lens of people who are living it um, and that disadvantaged communities from the perspective of those neighborhoods and who are in them. Um, so I, I, so I, I say that partly on the policy side because I'm not, I'm not convinced on this half mile test thing or that being the priority over these larger trails, but also in terms of process um, that I really want to, I, 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 this is not new, uh, but, but I really want to avoid a situation in which we are turning to you know, regional bike or regional equity organizations to ask the question about what should be the priority for the Broderick neighborhood. Um, uh, when those organizations have, in many cases, not a single member that are in the Broderick neighborhood. Uh, we need to understand and, and consult broadly, but I don't, I, the, 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 the strategic development plan sort of moving to partners and to stakeholders, um, I, I want to be, I, I want us to be very thoughtful about what we mean by that. Um, and what, what uh, there's the conceptual partners, conceptual stakeholders, but then there are real people um, and real people's actual daily um, experiences and aspirations and hopes for themselves and for their families and their actual needs. And their most of their needs are not expressed in terms of what we often think of. Most they don't think of most of their trips as being getting to the Social Security office or to pick up an unemployment check or go to a court date. They're mostly thinking about what David said, which is I wanted I, you know I, I find I work six days a week. I'm working two jobs, and on Saturday is my one my one time to spend the, the day with my granddaughter. And I wanna, I really wanna take a walk or a bike out to the river. And we have to see that. We have to see people's real lives and not just their not just their deficits. So uh, it's a long rant, but that's what we're we're all living through long rants every day, <laughs> right, right, right now. Um, and and I and I and I'm, I'm it's partly this item, and partly I just want I want as planners, not just our staff, but us as planners to have some humility about what our power is and who our obligation is to. All right, uh, other comments on this one? Uh, the Director Semayoa. Um, and I apologize first um, to staff. Um, the last time we, uh, we talked about this, we had a presentation from uh, various um, other regions that kind of came up and, and kind of provided their uh, experiences, uh, humbled and, um, and so on. Um, I guess what I'm not getting out of this conversation is kind of what is our overreaching goals or our values. Um, so, you know, we talk about equity and we talk about recreation opportunities or getting people to, to jobs or maybe providing uh, new economic opportunities uh, for uh, small towns or, or commercial corridors. Um, maybe can you talk a little bit about that kind of the overall umbrella or goals or things that are good? Are value valuable on, as we plan as we move forward? Because um, I guess maybe some of some of that might answer some of the comments that have been made uh, about what's important as we move forward on this. And maybe that's already been presented. And maybe I just need to rehear it. Well, we have a couple of different things that we're looking at. Kind of how it ties to. Uh, what we have stated in our long range plan. And from that, the main premise of this was to look at what our regional trail network is in both 
like what it is right now and what it wants to be. And that is still yet to be completely identified of what are the unifying factors? What do we want to do to move forward on this? And that's part of what we'll be asking you to weigh in later this year about how exactly do we prioritize between uh, something that is going to, a trail network that's going to emphasize safety versus a trail network that's going to emphasize recreational potential. And it might be that the, the final alignment of a trail system does kind of vary based on where you're passing through in that area, what the priorities are in Marysville may not be the same as what the priorities are in West Sacramento and what you're looking to experience. Same way, we don't have the same issues on the ground in each of these different communities across our region. So we are trying to look at what unifies us as a region when we're determining how we're going to develop this regional trail network and then also what you as the board wants to prioritize for determining what forms this regional trail network i i guess i um i i think if whatever we do let's figure out quickly what we want whether it's recreational or accessibility or uh, economic opportunities, and let's do something well, uh, with it, or multiple things, testing testing them out or something, just because of the limited amount of resources available, and then people just get tired of waiting for things to happen. Um, if we're going to create a, uh, um, what, I, what, I, what I'm interested in is, as we're talking about equity, is how do we provide um, opportunities for, for uh, new entrepreneurs to come into the market and maybe participate in this, where there's, uh, you know, businesses related to trails, walkability, bikes, whatever that may be, um, how, you know, whether maybe they have a business and, um, you know, how do, how do we engage with those businesses to kind of participate in this as well? So uh, maybe that's one way that we can kind of also promote uh, equity, uh, assuring that uh, we, we have opportunities for, for private investment and new entrepreneurs and new capital kind of come into this for uh, private and public uh, uh, partnerships. Um, uh, and for me, like hubs make a big sense, especially for commercial corridors. How do we create these hubs where people can meet and, a, and it's maybe a new entrepreneur can actually monetize for that particular hub that connects to various different uh, places, whether it starts in Marysville and, and, and it can connect to uh, uh, Auburn or, or, uh, or Lincoln, you know, how do we make those connections? And, and then, you know, I, I guess I'm trying to find uh, kind of those unifying things that we all agreed on. And I know that's what you're asking for. In my mind, um, economic development and, and opportunities for private investment uh, could really help uh, mul multiple things, uh, including uh, uh, equity oh. issues. Thank you. Jessica, we had the one Q&A question that was in the Q&A that appeared for all of us also. Yes, I can read that. Um, I received a public comment from Kevin Busey. He says, Victoria, what about the Lagoon Creek Interregional Trail? Is that the type of regional trail you were looking for? I we have been working with different cities and counties throughout the region about what these what trail efforts they are working on already including the laguna creek uh, trail that they are now elk grove is now in the process of how they can create uh, connections from the laguna creek trail beyond their existing boundaries and I think that that is something that is going to be under consideration when we form this this trail network but it does also depend on uh, what the priorities are as determined by the board. Okay. Director, uh, Director Joyner you disappeared off my screen there but you, you went off mute for a second did you have a comment? 
Awesome. Right, are there other questions or comments on this item? Erica Baldwin, it looks like Director Soon has his hand. Oh, raised. There, oh an actual hand. Okay, <laughs> Director Soon. Thanks, Chair. Uh, well, I think I think Mr. Busey beat me to the punch. I, I was going to bring it up too. I think uh, in general, uh, the, this regional uh, trails and parks uh, strategic plan development plan uh, will be a great amenity for for the the entire region uh, for all the things that that were mentioned. Uh, Director Samoa Samoa um, mentioned, um, but the uh, just the as Kevin Busey started talking about the Laguna Creek Trail. You know, com connecting east west uh, of our city, which has kind of been a major disconnect, uh, I think, for us trying to, you know, that 90, the Highway 99 tends to be that divider for us. But it also goes through um, what is a good part of the em environmental justice area in the, the 2020 MTP SCS environmental justice area and, and is able to connect us to um, transit up in Sacramento. So I look forward uh, to uh, the conversations with the stakeholders when uh, when say COG staff reaches out uh, to talk a little bit more about that with them. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. You're on mute, Chair Cabaldon. You're sorry. on mute. Sorry, any other comments on this item? Uh, oh, Carlos. If, if I could just, uh, uh, Director Samo, you, know, you asked a great question, right? Which is sort of what are the what are the goals here? And I and I um, think we've we've enumerated some of those um, prior, but uh, certainly happy to get back to you. I think the maybe I'll just try to sort of close it by saying we think we have a tremendous opportunity in this region, and the opportunity is really to connect communities across across all six counties. Uh, Director Sander was was noting about sort of the canals uh, and actually our side project on a federal stimulus list. We've been working with a lot of our flood control agencies and looking at the opportunities to take some of the, the tops of levees and actually make those connections between communities. Uh, I know Director Jennings, this is one of his passions for uh, the pocket and um, our Greenhaven, right? Um, so, so we think, and that was why we brought the speaker in for the, uh, one of our last in-person workshops, uh, what I think back in February, we think we have a tremendous opportunity. So the first kind of task here is to look at what might this look like to, uh, to sort of knit together what are, you know, uh, some really nice but disconnected sets of, of, of more localized sub-regional trails around the region. And then I think we want to look, we want to try to get into this question with all of you next year as Victoria has outlined in your calendar, how might you prioritize those based on some of those goals that you asked about, right? One of which is connectivity for disadvantaged communities, another one of which is economic development. So I, I, so we, we hear you, we, we would ask for uh, your creative thinking right now in these opportunities on those, on those uh, rights of way, those levees, those canals. Um, we, we think there's a, there's a great opportunity here to think creatively. And then I think what we wanna do um, is in next year, work with you and all of our local partners to figure out what would this regional network look like it? How might it actually improve connectivity and um, especially for disadvantaged communities? And then can we get some set, sense of priorities about how to fill in some of these gaps from a regional perspective? I hope that's helpful. Um, as I've said to some of you, uh, with the future never being more uncertain and questions about things like mass transit and shared mobility being really uncertain, uh, one thing we do know is that people are gonna wanna walk or ride a bike and be with their family and their loved ones. And we just think this is a great opportunity and one that we're excited about. So thanks for your, your feedback and comments today. We're going to the other committees and we'll be, uh, we've got some, got some great opportunities to work on this. So thanks again. All right, thanks. And thanks for for highlighting that, Ricky, as well. The, the, no, I, I completely agree. I, mean, I think that the and where where I'm where I've been struggling is I just I, the emphasis on what the regional role is 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 around connectivity, um, and uh, so as as we do that, um, I just don't I don't want to invite I don't want to invite the whole region into micromanaging how a community works, right? Um, uh, and uh, so this is not the moment for that. It is how to how to how to make those how to, how to make those connections. The things that only SACOG can bring to the table, as opposed to SACOG sort of second 
creating a framework for second guessing uh, what we're trying to accomplish on a community by community basis in terms of our um, the local networks of our trails. And, Okay, thank you. Uh, so information item only, so we'll proceed to item five, which is establishing green zones to support green means go. Uh, Ms. Hardgrove? Yep, good morning. I'm gonna start sharing my screen. I have a short presentation on the green zones, which I started at the end, here we go. Um, a short presentation on green means go, specifically on the green zones. As you all know, um, Green Means Go is an important strategy for reducing vehicle miles traveled and achieving our 19% greenhouse gas reduction uh, strategy or target in the MTPSCS. <clears throat> but it, it, Green Means Go is also a strategy for more than that. It is a way to achieve many of the goals of MTP, uh, many of the goals that are in the MTP. We do see it as a strategy for um, helping to revitalize our commercial corridors and main streets, helping better utilize existing public assets and infrastructure, preserving ag land, um, accelerating housing production, increasing economic activity. At a very high level, the Green Means Go strategy is really three things, um, and they are considered almost sort of a layered or a targeted, or a layered or a tiered approach that really starts with increasing and accelerating infill development, and then layering on in these areas, transportation options and electric vehicle infrastructure. It's about targeting investment in a specific place to achieve the MTP SCS goals that I just talked about. So identifying the place, sort of step one of a place-based investment strategy is really identifying the place or the green zones. And that's really what I'm here to talk about today. At a high level, we've always talked about the green zones will need to be in our infill areas. And we've talked about our infill areas being as described by our MTP SCS map, which is the map here. Apologies, it doesn't have a legend. And I saw a note in the Q&A to make sure I go over the colors of this. So I do want to take a quick second to talk about that. The red are the center and corridor communities. The gray just outside and in and around the red are um, the established communities. Then the purplish color are what we're calling developing communities. The light yellow, rural residential communities. And then the green are agricultural open spaces, areas of other economic activity that we aren't considering for future urban development um, in this MTP SCS. And on this map, it's really these gray and red areas, the centers and corridors in the established communities that we talk about and think of as established, um, or sorry, excuse me, infill areas. So these really are the areas where we would be um, targeting the green zones. And the reason we're focused on infill as the place for the green zones is because we know that re, um, you see a reduction and you can see a reduction in vehicle miles traveled per person when you have one or more of these um, conditions present, when there's a density of people and things, when things are closer to each other, when you have more transportation options available. And these are characteristics that we typically see in our established and infill areas. So from our modeling, we know that um, growth and can happen in these areas and combine it with the transportation options and you will be able to see that BMT reduction on a per capita basis. So in your staff report today there's an attachment A which is a draft framework for establishing the green zones. The key components of this framework are, again, that it must be in an infill area as defined by our MTP SCS by being in one of these centers and corridors or established communities. Um, it also must have local policies or actions to support growth in that infill area. That's key to the Green Means Go strategy um, working. And so because it does have to have that local policy support, it really makes the most sense for local agencies, the cities and the counties to lead this process of identifying the green zones. So we've set up a process that really would in, um, 
sort of set out a nomination process where local agencies would um, work with partners, work internally, consider their priorities, and then tell SACOG what should be the green zones for their jurisdiction. We are looking at a very simple online application for doing that. Um, just a few questions and then also we'll be providing a number of data and, and a mapping tool where jurisdictions can go in and, and be able to look at um, sort of the, the whole database that SACOG has of all different types of data to sort of help inform their conversations as they're deciding which green zones to nominate in their communities. So this is a, a draft framework for you today. Um, I would love any discussion or input you have. The timeline for green zones started back in April when I started. we started a conversation at the Land Use and Natural Resource Committee on what would some of the inputs and policy considerations be to such a framework. Now we're here today um, at this committee and we'll also be at the Land Use Committee this afternoon sharing the draft framework. Um, depending on the input that we get today, we would like to get this draft framework as well as the draft application and the mapping materials out to all of the local agency staff, our partners, stakeholders, um, for really a summer vetting of the process so we can collect any input that anybody has on um, the framework that you have here, as well as the application itself, so that by August, we could come back to the full board to request an action on this framework, and then really um, hit go at that point, and in the fall, over September and October, have the locals start that local nomination process, so that hopefully by December, we have a regional set of green zones that we would bring back to the board for an action on. And that would, um, again, these green zones would be the places where if we are successful in getting future green means go funding, these are the green, the green zones are the places where that money will be targeted. Um, I will quickly mention that the Land Use and Natural Resource Committee this afternoon is also hearing an item on the Regional Early Action Planning Funds. That's um, just under $6.8 million that SACOG is getting from the state, Department of um, Housing and Community Development for housing planning activities in our region. And the committee is, is, has a framework for how we are proposing to spend those funds. A small, a, a portion of those funds, approximately 1.7 million is, um, being requested to set up a competitive grant program that would really be geared towards planning activities in these green zones. So for a successful getting green zones in place by the end of this year, the, um, early, the regional early action planning funds would be setting aside some of that funding for the early part of next year to really kick off a um, grant opportunity to advance some of the planning work in these green zones. And that's my um, presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions and would love to have any discussion from the committee. Thank you, Ms. Hargrove. Are there questions or discussion? We are the, we're, we're just a secondary review here. The Land Use Committee is the primary committee on this item, but uh, are there any questions or feedback? Uh, Mr. Samayoa. See, I'm assuming that our staff have been reached out to and they understand that the, their timeline or their applications are coming or start identifying projects or that's that's sort of the next step we, we are bringing it um, to committee this week um, today and then any refinements or anything we need to hear and tweak on the framework will do that but it will really be next week next week will be a very broad broadcast to all of your staff all partners and we'll give them um, roughly a five to six week time to review it all, comment and come back to us before we ask for the board action on this. Um, one of the things that, um, and I'm glad to hear that there's gonna be some um, possible planning dollars or opportunities for planning dollars to, um, in, in our area, some of, the, some of our biggest struggles are gonna be with um, agencies like um, Union Pacific and um, 
Uh, so uh, I guess my point is, is like, um, I don't know how we bring those folks into the conversation as well so they can kind of at least be um, know that something like that because there might be some some projects that include having uh, to deal with you know uh, Union Pacific specifically. Okay. Sure, you're the, um, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up and I don't have good news for you on Union Pacific at least on any news at the moment but um, I will say between green zones and I mentioned this federal stimulus effort to identify projects and thank you Director Soon for connecting us to a bunch of agencies. Um, what's actually been really helpful and, I, and I, I think there's an opportunity as we go forward in the development of green zones with all of your local staff to bring some of our other agency partners into this, some of whom you sit on their boards. Uh, Regional Water Authority, PCWA, Regional SAN, SMUD, uh, maybe PG&E. But, but we've actually had some really interesting conversations that this topic has allowed us to have about how do we get our agency partners to align um, and actually maybe make it easier to do some of this really harder to do kind of redevelopment in these commercial corridors and your downtown. So I, um, I, I'm hopeful. I, I think there's a real opportunity there. Uh, again, for some of our some of our partner agencies and Director Sanders has been very eloquent about this, right? And regional SAN and the fees and everything else. But uh, so I, I think that's another opportunity for us as we as we go forward. And, and again, to, be, to emphasize, work with your staff for to develop these kind of locally driven and locally designated green zones. What's the bad news about Union Pacific? No, there's not, nothing. <laughs> there's no, that's the best news you can get with Union Pacific. <laughs> no, but, and, and I will look, I, we, I, I know, I know in, in many ways for many of you, um, uh, working with them, um, you know, alignment, whether it's actually the active, active rail corridors, the abandoned rail corridors back to the trails plan, uh, moving major pieces of infrastructure, right, to unlock development uh there's there's we know there's a lot to do there so can i, can I just and i know director sanders is going to weigh in as well i just want to, on, the, on that point and sort of in relationship to what we just talked about in the prior item is the i, I recall like when when uh, the legislature started first getting really helpful on affordable housing and uh, they were you know they would pass laws saying that you know you they, they'll give you this money but you can only do it if it's a hundred percent affordable and there can't be any retail in it at all. We said, well, hey, but you know, the, the economics don't work and people that live there want to have you know, some access to coffee or whatever. So they said, okay, you can have this much retail, but we're only paying for the project. Um, we said, well, but, but if there's no laundromat in the neighborhood, then, then, uh, you know, the, then folks can't live a productive, you know, the life that they, want, that they want. Okay, so you can have certain things, but you can't have dry cleaner for sure, right? So it's a, the, and, and we've had to constantly remind our, our, our friends and our, and our fellow policymakers that there's more, the thing that you want uh, often requires a lot of other things around it in order to succeed. And so as we think about these zones being the zones that we are trying to in incentivize and induce the kinds of projects and development that is going to lead to the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, the changes in vehicle miles travel and all of that, that there, there may be projects that are supportive of that that don't physically sit inside the zone, right? It may be that the, it is a, there's a rail spur that could be converted to a trail that goes all the way up to the green zone, um, but does not go into the green zone, right? That, that is, is, would be an essential in many for that sort of, so I, 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 I don't wanna, I'm not, I'm not trying to stir the pot on it, but I just think we, as we, since we're the ones writing this up ourselves, that being, you know, creating some space in there to understand that, and the trail is an example, what, what Mr. Sander was describing earlier around, um, you know, deliveries and, you know, if you had a, if you had a central um, um, industrial center for folks to walk to and pick up their Amazon packages, for example, that was two blocks away, but that is an industrial zone, not in the green zone, um, then can you fund that, right? So those, the, the, let's keep ourselves open where we can to the kind, to, to, to a, a more contextualized, more uh, the approach to what is actually going to be necessary to, to make these green zones really fly. And you may already be doing that. It's hard to tell right now because the because you've just shown us the infill zones, which are so big, they definitely will accomplish most of that. But as you start to think more carefully and, and get more discreet, think uh, paying, uh, being attentive to the to the ecosystem uh, dynamics will be helpful. But Director Sander? 
Uh, you know, I'm, I'll try to be brief here because you guys have heard, you know, some about commercial corridors, but our, our meetings have been really insightful, I think, for a lot of people sitting around the table. And one of the clear conclusions is, and, and we used to hear about this 10, 15 years ago, you know, you got to create a sense of place where people are attracted to in order for development to be successful. So sort of what Christopher was just talking about, that may include a dry cleaner, but you have to have the sense of place. But really what's come to the fore in our more recent discussions is the need for you have to have a critical mass of people on that corridor that support the corridor, as opposed to assuming people around the corridor are going to come there and support it. You really have to create that ecosystem. And as a biologist, I guess, you know, that makes a lot of sense to me. You've got to create enough people living in that zone to support that zone. And so it requires density. It requires the, the reuse of commercial space into residential property. And that's really been heightened by the Amazonification, you know, of our of our retail sphere and everything being done by delivery now instead of by the local store, or nearly everything. And and the transition of those properties is is a challenge. And so every tool we can pile up in support of that, I think, is really critical to the future health of these these commercial corridors. And so this plan using Green Means Go uh, to create these these green zones. Um, that support this commercial corridor remodel, I think is, I think we're right on course here. We just have to not let up. We have to keep the pressure on the state, keep the pressure on ourselves, honestly, find as many tools and resources as we can to facilitate these transitions. I might be saying a bad word, but it looks like we have to like pull out our Jane Jacobs books and God, if I had a dollar for every time I was walking down in downtown Marysville and somebody was like grabbing me about a Jane Jacobs book, I'd have <laughs> a, a dollar, dollar now. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right, any other uh, questions or comments on this one, James? I, I just want to I want to build on what Director Sanders said and. Um, you know, uh, we actually, we, we opened up about a year, year and a half ago. Jen knows, did all the really great staff work here with a lot of your staff locally, but we kind of had these pre-applications for green zones. So some of your, some of your jurisdictions and your staff came in and said, eh, this is a sort of a concept of what this might look like. Uh, others of you passed resolutions. Remember 28 of 28 regional jurisdictions now fully in support of Green Means Go. But um, as our job has just gotten a lot harder with the massive hole and this has been blown in the state budget, and we've, um, we've turned our attention to really trying to make our case with the recovery task force, the governor's recovery task force, uphill climb as that is. The fact that we have done as much groundwork as we have, we have the commercial quarter task force, we've identified the green zones, that we're actually taking our MTPSES and we're trying to implement this beyond transportation. Uh, I just want to echo what Director Sanders said, and it, we should be relentless. And uh, we, you know, we have other regions that are a bit ahead of us on this. We need to, we need to lap them. And um, I just want to, I want to keep on that, that message. Uh, the more work we can do, the more prepared we can be, the more we've identified infrastructure, the more we've identified shovel ready infrastructure, the more we have our partners at the table, um, the better we will be. This, this, this is not easy and it won't, um, it'll, it'll take years, but I'm, I am hopeful. All right. I'll say. All right, then thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. That concludes our regular business. Mr. Corliss, do you have any, are there any other matters to bring before the committee? Uh, no. Dr. Bolton. Yes. I'd just like to note for the record that we did have a public comment from Dan Ellison, which was addressed by Jennifer. He was just clarifying the colors uh, right. meaning in the map. All right. Okay, then uh, with no other matters to go before the committee, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all uh, to members of the committee and our staff and the members of the public who participated. Have a great, have a safe, uh, a safe day. Yes, thank you all. Thank you all. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Bye, thank you. Thank you.